Hello, everyone, and welcome to Basecamp, a climbing magazine podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Riley. Thank you for tuning in. This is the October-November episode, which means that the October-November issue is on newsstands now. If you're not already a subscriber, make sure you pick up a copy at your local gear store or local climbing gym or local bookstore because it's a fabulous issue with lots of in-depth features. We got one about Albania. We got one about Cochise Stronghold in Arizona and one from the Piz, Rob Pism, about Uniweep in Colorado. Okay, our first conversation will be with James Lucas and Matt Samet, both climbing editors. Both wrote articles for the skills department in the issue about the benefits of home climbing walls and how systems like the Moonboard can improve your climbing. If you're into training, you're going to love this. We really deep dive on all the different systems out there, including the Moonboard and the Tension Board and the Kilter Board. Matt talks about putting up the Grasshopper adjustable wall in his garage. He's been training a ton, and he's been sending his projects, so it seems to be working. So again, if you're into training or just looking for ways to get a little bit stronger, I mean, who's not looking to get stronger? You're going to love this conversation. Then we have a conversation with Kyle Vasilopoulos that was recorded when I was in Lander, Wyoming for the International Climbers Festival. Kyle's a restaurateur in Lander, Wyoming that also happens to be an ambassador for a number of brands, including Mystery Ranch, Camp, and Adidas. I talked to Kyle about the 10 sleep controversy, how he became a co-owner of the legendary cowfish in Lander, and why Lander is such a great place to call home for climbers. So let's get to it, but first, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Mystery Ranch, based in Bozeman, Montana. Mystery Ranch builds the best load-bearing equipment in the world for men and women with the job to do. Made with the best materials available and the most durable construction methods that exist to support your mission, whether it's on the front line, the fire line, the cleanest line, or the steepest line. At the last International Climbers Festival, I connected with Becky Switzer, Mystery Ranch ambassador, got to ask her what she loves about Mystery Ranch and its products. So, Becky, how's your International Climbers Festival going? Oh, it's great. It's always inspiring to see all the folks who travel across the country to come to Wyoming. Yeah, and it's so beautiful here in City Park, just hanging out by the river and all the camping. It's really a special place. Yeah, Lander is really the perfect place for this event. How did you get connected with Mystery Ranch? So, I've known people in their crew for over a decade. I started out with a ski pack of theirs and have always been impressed with the quality, the construction, the durability. It's just a great company because it matches with my activities, climbing being the primary one, but also skiing and ice climbing. Yeah, and what do you love about the packs? They carry a lot of weight very easily, especially with the new Tower 47 coming out, the Kragging Pack. It can take a ton of weight and it can feel really good on your back. And one of the neat things about Mystery Ranch is that it's really customizable. So being a shorter female with a short torso, this pack fits me great. If I'm carrying an 80 meter rope and 20 draws, like it's totally manageable. Fall 2019 marks Mystery Ranch's debut back in the technical climbing packs with the launch of the new Scepter series, specifically designed for ice climbers. Then in spring 2020, Mystery Ranch welcomes three more rock specific packs into the collection, including the Tower 47. Learn more at mysteryranch.com. Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. Okay, sitting here with Matt Samet and James Lucas, we are here to talk about the October-November issue, which is just a really phenomenal issue. Great job on this one. Thank you. Um, love the cover from Una Weep. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful shot. And there's a lot of great departments in here, a lot of kind of like impact, environmental-related departments, a lot of skills, training, and three really, really great features. We have a feature... Um, from Rob Pism about kind of the history and kind of the resurgence over at Uniweep. We have another article about Kochi Stronghold, about Aaron Mike, a uh, Navajo guide around there talking about the history of Cochise, and another feature about Albania. Mm -hmm. So really three great features that really uh, brought me in there. So love the issue, but I wanted to talk to you guys specifically about the skills, because you guys each wrote a department about home walls and, and training. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, I'll start with you. Um, you built a home wall at your place. Why did you end up doing that? 
Well, I actually had an existing home wall. I've been in the same house since 2012. So I had a home wall in there uh -huh. that uh, a carpenter buddy who I hired and I kind of put together. And it was just like your standard Woody. So if I ever wanted to change the roots, I'd obviously have to go in there myself and like unscrew the holes and move the tape around. And after a while, it just got to be too much. And I just sort of stopped using the wall. And I was uh -huh. like, ah. Oh. You're not a route setter, huh? Yeah, I'm a really lazy route setter. People come over and they'd be like, sweet, cool wall in your garage. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. You know, which is pretty <laughs> lame to say. Yeah. But I just, I could, it was hard. I live kind of out in the sticks a little bit and people don't want to come over. So I just couldn't keep it going myself. But then I really got into moonboarding a lot this around February of this year. So before you go any further, can you mm -hmm. kind of describe to me what moonboarding is? Mm -hmm. So the moonboard, you know, basically it's a 25 or 40 degree overhanging wall and the holds are on a grid and they're, it's the same grid all over the world. So there's two sets of holds, the 2016 set and the 2017 set, and it has LED lights under the holds that light up Mm -hmm. to show the problems and then these plug into a database I think it's like 52,000 problems at this point wow it's a huge database you know it's been they've been building on this database since I don't know like 2005 or something is when the first moon board mm -hmm. came out they weren't always driven by apps and LED lights that happened in 2016 I believe but okay basically it's like a, a woody with I think the I have the 2017 set it was 198 holds yeah and, you can just light up whatever problem you want. So you can be like, oh, I want to try V5. Boom, light it up, you know, boom. Like you use the filter to select for problems. Suddenly there's, you know, hundreds of options, light them up, look at what you want to try and try it. And you can also add new problems to the database too. So you can be like, oh, cool, I want to set a problem today. Mm -hmm. Light up the holes you want, try it, tweak the beta, change the holds out, and then you can submit it to the database and other users can comment on it or ignore it as they, as they see fit. Nice. And so you can use this moon board on like any type of wall. You can build your own or are there other kits that you can purchase? Yeah. I mean, you can build, you know, moon climbing has a how to guide for how to build your own moon board. You just need two by fours and plywood to basically build the climbing wall surface. Sure. What we ended up doing, which I think is, is really cool, is we got a, a grasshopper adjustable wall. Mm -hmm. And so grasshopper industries is, is relatively new. It's, it's Boom Speed and Jeremy Huckins and they sort of put their heads together and they're like, huh, like there's this huge push lately with app driven boards, the moon board, the kilter board, the tension board. There was one other out of Australia. I don't know if it's still around. Um, and they're like, what if we provide kind of the foundational walls for these, you know? So they've come up with the grasshopper board, which James and I put in. Um, it was really easy to put together, really nice, like metal components, really smooth nice climbing surface and it's compatible with all the different hold systems so you okay. can put that up and you can be like i'm going to put on moon holds or i'm going to put on tension holds or i'm going to put on the smaller set of kilter holds and then you can have an adjustable wall and the one we have also has a hand crank so you can change the angle although i don't quite have the space for it okay uh, in my garage because we had to cut a hole in the kind of roof of the garage to make room for the wall and speaking of space how much space do you really need to install one of these so the grasshopper adjustable wall, I was looking at their site the other day, I think they said you need 20 by 20 of floor space. Okay. And vertical, uh, what is it, so either 11 feet or 13 feet? Probably 13. I think it's 13. Yeah, they yeah. stick up pretty well. Like the wall is 8 by 12 at 40 degrees. So, it, you know, you have to have, you have to consider you not only need room for the wall, but you also need room for you. Like mm -hmm, when right. you're lunging for those top holds. Yeah, you're going to be swinging out. So if there's something behind your head, it's yeah. going to be a little creepy. You want like a few. It's nice to have space on either side, and then lots of space back from the board. Okay. Yeah. Like the more space you have, and the more open the board is, the more comfortably you can climb on it. Yeah, it's more versatile because there's there'll be a lot of problems that are on one side of the board or the other. And if they're too close to the side, and you have like a wall right there, yeah, mm -hmm. you're not really going to want to do those problems. You're like flagging against the wall. Yeah, which can make it nicer. You're like, <laughs> yeah, the foot's over there. <laughs> <laughs> Just dab on the wall a little bit. Yeah. So how was the construction of the grasshopper? How'd that go? Well. James and I are construction bumblies, um, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if we're a good benchmark, but in terms of that, compared to like having actually built that other wall in my garage, where we were just kind of figuring out as we went, it's, it's so streamlined and simple. I mean, it's definitely like geared towards the end user, and there's just not, it's, it's great because it's all standardized. I mean, it's kind of like I, 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 Ikea, 
kit. It's mm-hmm. like put the pieces out, figure out how to put them together, and then lift the wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. What what was your experience, James? Yeah, it seemed like the the crux uh, for the construction was actually uh, dealing with the the garage space, the pre planning before that, because uh, yeah. like Matt's ceiling wasn't quite tall enough, and so we had to like do some funky stuff with that. But the actual construction of the grasshopper board was super straightforward. It was like Matt said. It's so like we opened everything, and then it was like, okay, this is piece A, this is piece B, this is piece <laughs> C. Okay, A goes to B goes to C. <laughs> it definitely took us a little while to figure it out, but uh, we like connected the alphabet. And all in, how many hours do you think it takes? Is it a, a half a day, a day, a I week? I mean, I think, I think you could probably do it in a half a day, do a day to get the frame Jeez. assembled. In terms mm-hmm. of getting it up, that really depends on your space. You know, like sure. if you have like a racquetball court or a high, you know, high ceiling three car garage with tons of room and pretty obvious beams that you're going to hoist the thing onto, it's pretty obvious. Like in my garage, it was a small two guard garage with an eight foot ceiling and the storage attic above it. So we had to like cut a hole in the storage attic, cut away some of the floor beams, and then mm-hmm. I can figure out mm-hmm. how are we gonna get this in there? Cause we weren't working with much space. Cause the board needs to, obviously it's assembled on the ground and then it needs to come up. So when it's coming up, you know, there needs to be clearance at the top of the board too. So I think if you have a big wide open space, but a lot of it, yeah, will d- depend on what you're doing. I know in talking to Boone, him and Jeremy are working on a smaller one, a home wall. I think that's gonna be eight by 10 maybe was the mm-hmm. goal. I think they were calling it the ninja wall. Mm-hmm. Um, no kicker sort of designed to go fit in like your average room like the one we're sitting in like most bedrooms um it would work with you know you'd have to have like kind of cut off moonboard problems but i think tension's got uh something in their app where you can remove the kicker panel and there's problems set just for that mm-hmm. so yeah their, their goal is to make a smaller one too more for, mm-hmm. for end users and homes well even yeah. just taking let's say it takes a day i mean i built a home wall in my place when i was in college and that took me like three days mm-hmm. to like actually build the frame and drill all the holes and put in all the T-nuts and yeah. all of that. It's a pretty arduous process, but it seems like that's all pretty streamlined with the grasshopper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely like a lot of the mundane tasks, like drilling the holes yeah. for both like the T-nuts and the lights. Uh huh. It's, it's all, all taken care of. All taken care of, yeah. which is super nice. Yeah. yeah. It's just like... The IKEA set instructions and then putting stuff together with like a couple of tools, a couple of like Allen wrenches. Yeah, like a drill and yeah. an Allen wrench, I think is all we needed. And how long have you had that in your place for now, Matt? Was it June when we finished it? Yeah, I think so. And it, has it been holding up pretty well? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. totally bomber. Yeah. I nice. like, see that thing's not, yeah. It's, it's very well constructed. Like it doesn't wobble at all when you climb on it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got two side cables and then the adjustment cable in the middle. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. And yeah. what about cost? What does something like that run for? So I think the one we have, the adjustable climbing wall, is like eight eighty nine ninety five, eight thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. And then the set of moon holds, if you buy like the twenty seventeen set, plus the LED lights, plus you know like the the computer thing that goes in the back, I think that ends up being about. Twenty nine hundred dollars or something okay. like that. Yeah. You know, so it's 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 not cheap. But you know, I just talked to a friend of mine actually. So he built a new house, or he he bought a new house up in the mountains, and he put in a tension board. Um, and I think he he made the wall adjustable himself. He's really handy, you know. And he, and he like did the math, and he was like, well, between me and my wife, we were paying, I don't know, three grand a year for mm-hmm. a gym membership or something like that. Mm-hmm. And the tension setup probably costs three grand right plus yeah. whatever he spent mm-hmm. on the wall say another two grand so basically in two years they've more than paid off their home wall right but plus, that, plus you get the advantage of the wall is at your house so mm-hmm. you're not like driving back and forth i mean it only takes like one car accident going to the gym <laughs> <laughs> you're like all, your forearms are all pumped you're driving home you're like oh <laughs> Death by moonboard foam. <laughs> yeah. It could, it could happen. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know. And what was the process behind actually putting in the moonboard system into the grasshopper? So, it was really simple because the T-nuts are already on and the LEDs uh, holes are drilled. So that 
was pretty simple. Putting the holds on is definitely time consuming. Yeah, we had yeah because like, they all have to be at the same angle yeah. and everything, mm-hmm. right? There's mm-hmm. an orientation, there's a position and an orientation for each hold, and so we actually ran it with the three of us, uh, Nina, uh, myself, and Matt, and like one person would um, grab the hold, another person would say where the hold belonged and mm-hmm. the orientation and then the third person would just put it in yeah and so it, we like got a system set up and it was just like vroom, 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 vroom. and that there's like how many holds 198 yeah 198 yeah, 140 on the 2016 set yeah so there's quite a few holds and um but we were able to pretty much get everything up in just a couple hours I think it was more like four or five hours. <laughs> yeah. It was a while. But yeah. you want to get them just right. I mean, you geek out, right? Yeah, because sure. when you do the problems, you're like, okay, cool. I really like Mitch Master Hard. I want it to feel the same on this board as it mm-hmm. felt on the one at the gym. So you're like, okay, that hole needs to be just so. Yeah. So like, we put on the holds, and then we started climbing on the wall over the next few days, and we'd climb with kind of like wrenches and mm-hmm. tweak them a little, and we'd put in set screws to just get them to, to stay yeah. put. Mm-hmm. You know, so you kind of geek out on it, but now it's like, yeah, perfect. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned a few different systems, the moon board, the tension board, and the kilter board. Mm-hmm. Are they pretty similar? Are there differences? I would mm-hmm. turn it over to James, who's quite more on these different... Uh, I would say the basic concept of them all is not is the same. Yeah. Right? It's pretty much really powerful climbing. The difference comes in the hold sets. The tension board is uh, symmetrical, so... You draw a line straight down the middle, and the holds on the right mirror the ones on the left. Mm-hmm. Um, they also use wood grips. And climbing on the wood, it feels a little bit different. It's a little gentler on your skin, but... But more difficult, I would Yeah, imagine. but it's more, more difficult. Yeah. Um, the, the holds are really good. That's a great board to climb on. And then there's the, the kilter board, which has... Um, it has a lot more... All the holds are made by Kilter. I haven't climbed on it quite as much a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, but whereas like the moon holds tend to be kind of flat, uh, a lot of the Kilter holds are kind of in-cut, which is nicer because you can um, you don't get as much of the classic moon kick where your foot comes flying off the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, you can toe into stuff a lot harder. Okay, It feels a lot more fingery yeah. um, because you're like biting down on these in cuts it kind of reminds me of like climbing in Waco um, okay you can it's also a lot easier to climb on the kilter board at a steeper angle um, like you can climb on those things at like 40 degrees pretty easily but they're they're all great boards and they all have kind of the same style of app it's a little bit different for tension that and kilter than it is for moon but it's user submitted boulder problems and everybody's kind of climbing on the same board i think with uh the kilder boards they the standard set is actually a bit bigger than a, a moon board mm-hmm. it's quite wide yeah it's yeah. wide yeah and the the problems can be a little bit longer nice so once you had this up pretty much using it for training exclusively or was it also you know a system where you were climbing for fun as well I mean, at least for me, so I've been training, averse. I've been climbing for 32 years now, and I've kind of been training averse until, like, the last year. Uh Uh-huh. Like, I never, maybe I hangboarded a little bit on and off, but I just never, I never really had much systemized training, and I'm still kind of training averse, because I just, I'm just, like, a really impatient person. Mm -hmm. It's It's not like I need to see results quickly, it's just that I'm not good at monotony and repetition which a lot of like campusing, hangboarding, some of that other stuff is. So so earlier this year, I had been struggling on a project last year, and I was like, I, I, like, I need to get stronger. I can't just like, oh, I'm not going to eat cookies for a week, and I'll be strong enough. Like, is this your Staunton project? Yeah, out in Staunton State Park called Big Papa. And, you know, I was like doing okay, but I wasn't doing great. And it was, it was very clear to me that I needed to be stronger. And so I was like, I need to do something. So I worked with Nina Williams to get a training plan in place, and she's like, She'd watched me climb. We were on a climbing trip together and came in Brack. And she's like, you need to moonboard. I mean, she could just see I wasn't very powerful. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she's like, you have plenty of endurance, but you need to get more snap. So she prescribed moonboarding. So I started moonboarding at the at the local gym, the Boulder Rock Club, and kind of, at first really kind of hated it. I'm just yeah. like, oh, this is really really hard. Like your first time on that thing, even if you're kind of competent, experienced climber, it's probably going to kick your butt. Like. It's a lot of core, it's a lot of jumping, the holds feel small, you're sort of struggling to see the lights and to, to get used to the movement. You don't know the grid of holds yet, mm-hmm. so you're not familiar with how to grab them. You know, the problems will follow certain patterns on the holds, certain rubrics, so you're not familiar with any of that. And so I, I just remember feeling really at sea, but by the second or third time, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And you get pretty strong pretty quick. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least for me, the advantage has been that it combines I think some of the benefits you get from fingerboarding and campusing with just climbing because you're actually doing problems Mm -hmm. and they're really cool problems, especially like the benchmarks, the ones that have been vetted by their, their admins and that people sort of universally agree or the the standards for the grade. They're like really good problems. Like I was talking to Boone about it. He was like, yeah, man. He's like, I get really fired up to try like some of these things, you know, same as he would for like an outdoor project. Like some of these things, like you get psyched, you're like, whatever, day four. I'm going to do this, you know, yeah. it's mm-hmm. pretty cool. So yeah, it sort of combines like all the best, funnest part of climbing, the best part of bouldering, which is just pushing yourself as hard as you can. But then because of the nature of these boards, because they're so steep and so core and finger intensive, you also get like some system boarding, campus boarding, kind of finger boarding type benefits. That's what it feels like to me. Do you miss the gym at all? No. And <laughs> <laughs> the bigger volumes and the kind of more dynamic... I hate that. I yeah. hate that stuff. I, mean, I have really slick, hard skin, so sloper volumes in the gym, I just like dry fire off all the uh-huh. time. I mean, I'm, I still love going to the local gyms, and I think I, I still have memberships to two of them. Uh-huh. And I love to go in there just to climb, mm-hmm. but it's I've moved my training definitely to the home wall. Cool. Like the training training, I'm like, yeah, that's in the garage. Yeah. Climbing on a moonboard, it, it transfers a lot better to climbing outside um, interesting because it's so much m- more powerful you climb in a um, in like a commercially set gym and a lot of times the problems just you can squeak your way through them or finesse or they're a lot longer um, like the average time on a moonboard problem is about like 17 to 20 seconds yeah pretty short yeah it's short you're going like zah, zah, zah. Done. You're, yeah you're done <laughs> whereas like on a commercially set problem in the gym it can be up to a minute sure and so like that that difference is like it's significant and can you talk to a little bit to like training for power power endurance and endurance yeah sure so um if you want to get stronger, right, then that's just, like, your ability to pull. Mm-hmm. Like, doing a, uh, a weighted pull-up is yeah. kind of a feat of strength. Doing a campus board move, like 1-5, like, going from run 1 to 1-5, one that's a power move because it's, a, it's like, your ability to pull uh, over time. Like, you're, you're making this dynamic move and latching it. And then uh, power endurance is like, it would be doing like one, four, seven, mm-hmm. or doing uh, four or five uh, powerful moves in a row, yeah. where you need like a little more endurance to do that. And then endurance is just like, it'd be doing like laps of one, three, five, seven, one, three, five, seven, doing it three times. So that, that's the basic idea. And the way you can do that on a moon board, a kilter board, a tension board, any kind of system board is you can work um, you can work your strength just by like finding the smallest holds and just trying to like hang them or just trying to do pull-ups on them. Mm-hmm. That can be a little bit boring. Um, I find a better way and kind of more applicable way to do it is to train power by um, doing a, like one move boulder problems yeah. one or two move boulder problems like there's a classic move on this uh, benchmark problem called hard times yeah. where you are on a left hand pocket and you're on a right hand side pull you get your feet set up and you just cross 
to a little peanut hole. And um, just that one move, like trying that one move three to five times will increase your power. You'll like not only get stronger at pulling, like with your right hand off that gas on and twisting your body, so working your core, but you'll also get better at like snatching things, Mm -hmm. um, learning that skill set of like how to grab fast, how to move your body fast, how to target holds. Yeah. And also have like getting better at kind of finger power, almost like hitting a hold and grabbing it. Sure. And so you can um, train these power moves by doing like this limit bouldering, just like a couple moves where your your focus isn't on sending the boulder problem, but just on sticking like one or two moves, Mm -hmm. like just sticking that peanut hold or trying some other benchmark problem where you you find the crux move and mm-hmm. you and you just try that one move and uh that's it and then you can work your power endurance by doing uh like a whole boulder problem essentially so like you're doing like four or five moves of the of the moon board okay. um, <clears throat> you could add a couple moves to any moon board problem by just like traversing a little bit across the base or um, you can work at your power endurance more by doing like four by fours mm-hmm. or circuits are pretty big now yeah circuits yeah. Mm-hmm. board circuits where it's like 10 problems in 10 minutes rest mm-hmm. do it again right so it's like do a problem rest the rest of that minute do your next problem you know what I mean mm-hmm. yeah people have been kind of getting into that lately it sounds like it's a little less like I was talking to my friend Brian about it who's really into moon boarding and he and I and other people have been like, oh, it's less, like, four by fours, at least for me, can put me in the hole for days, mm-hmm. especially on the moon board. But, like, with these circuits, like, you get that power endurance burn and that boost, but you don't, like, just destroy yourself. Yeah. yeah. There's kind of, like, a, a lot of different ways to do it. Like, four by fours, when circuits, like Matt was suggesting, some people do, like, intervals where um, you take a stopwatch and you time yourself on on the boulder problem Mm -hmm. and then you rest as long as it took you Uh, and and then you could do another boulder problem rest as long as it took you do like another one and then like chill for a few minutes and then kind of do that and set again the the moon boards aren't great for training like strict endurance Mm -hmm. but i mean if you have power endurance, you have endurance. Yeah, yeah. It's like Tony Yanira says, like, without power, there's nothing to endure. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a community aspect to this as well? Where people, you know, are networking um, online with the problems that they're doing. And, like, I just wonder if this is going to grow beyond training. Mm-hmm. And people will start competing with each other as far as, like, earning points and stuff by doing certain circuits or problems. And... Yeah, well, they've already had, like, a Moon Climbing had a, a big comp a little while ago with, like, uh-huh. Alex Magos and Daniel and Daniel Woods and Margo Hayes, and they're kind of, like, all in different gyms across the world. Cool. They're like, doing it again this year. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, cool. And then, um, like, if you look up um, Moon Climbing on Instagram, you'll see, like, a huge community of people posting videos of themselves doing boulder problems there's a this guy in las vegas i i can't remember his name but i know his instagram okay he's like the number one moon warrior right ravioli biceps he's got like (laughs) (laughs) he's got huge arms big biceps yeah and a bunch of tattoos Uh and he's climbed like every problem on the moon board that's so crazy yeah it's crazy and he just has like videos of himself doing everything from like the classic 7a moonboard problem to like uh-huh. whatever the hardest thing is I think it was this thing Daniel Woods put up called Black Beauty so like some V12 or something or yeah V13, v- v13 maybe yeah. harder it, yeah. it's nails like That's killer. two holds yeah <laughs> you're like locking off and then taking it down to your kneecap and then doing it again yeah mm-hmm. yeah September 16th is the next moonboard masters competition so it'll be back uh, whatever next week wow cool i'll have to check that out yeah Yeah, that'd be sick to watch yeah i mean you can be so as a moonboard user you have an account and you can log problems and check your ranking against other users and stuff Uh too and like james said like on instagram i'm on a facebook group that's like moonboard climbers network you know where people kind of just 
ask questions and share beta. So there's, yeah, there's definitely plenty of, and you can comment on the problems too. I mean, kind of like you can comment on Roots and Mountain Project. Yeah. You can comment on the problems and note how many tries and, you know, yeah, yeah it's a pretty vibrant community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah. Well, thanks guys. Again, great job on the issue and Thank thanks for stopping by and chatting. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks. All right. Well, there's our conversation with Matt and James. And now on to speaking with Kyle Vasilopoulos. We're going to be jumping into the conversation at a point where Kyle and I were talking about the 10 sleep controversy. Truth be told, I really don't think Kyle wanted to talk about it much. But since he's been a route developer in the Wyoming area for so long, was interested on his take. So that's where we'll begin. Without further ado, Kyle Vasilopoulos. So is it, Lander's not really considered like the local community till Ten Sleep to Ten Sleep necessarily. Like how far is Ten Sleep from here? I mean, it's only it's like an hour or something. Well, like, it's probably two. Is it two? Okay. Two hours. Two and a half hours. Okay. But yeah, it's like a really good weekend crag for Lander. Sure. I think the issue that we have that kind of keeps everybody a little bit more separate is that. <clears throat> You know, both ten sleep and the climbing around lander is quite substantial. So mm -hmm. I just think you get kind of just sucked into, you know, there's just like so many options when you're in either place. You know, if you end up setting up shop and you're hanging out in ten sleep, there's not too much pressing reason to go and find, you know, the same kind of routes two and a half hours away. Sure. Because you got thousands of them right there. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing like when you're in lander. <clears throat> I mean, there are a lot of people that go on weekend trips to ten sleep from Lander. Don't, yeah. don't get me wrong. But, I mean, we also have the same kind of roots and the same, you know, style, the same dolomite, limestone. So, and there's thousands of roots here. So, Do you deal with any of those <clears throat> same issues as far as, you know, bolting, chipping, manufacturing routes I mean, around I, here? Not really. I would say, thankfully, I, I hope and I think that around here um, we don't actively deal with that stuff definitely not at all on the scale that's of whatever is happening right now intensely yeah it's kind of blown up it, yeah. it surprises me that that type of stuff still goes on yeah frankly <laughs> yeah i mean i think there's like very rare isolated instances of things that we talk about as a community and we we sort of have a dialogue and we we sort of continue to have a conversation about how we want to handle things but i mean on a scale from one to a hundred I think we're dealing in like a one to five and it seems like whatever's going on in 10 sleep is like near the hundred level mm -hmm. right now. So yeah. no, we don't, we don't have that going on here, nor have we for as long as, you know, I've been in and out of Lander for 20 some years sure. and, and, uh, you know, I mean, I, historically all over North America, there was that time period in the history of climbing where there was this sort of chipping ethic and, so yeah, I mean, every community um, that was active in that time period has these like sort of, sort of historic examples of things that are left over. But since that kind of whatever you want to call it, the golden age of that sort of ethic, yeah, thankfully it's really become like this dark art of climbing and mm -hmm. is sort of shunned and sort of not welcome in most communities. And yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to talk about it as a root developer because. I think anybody that develops roots knows full well that in order to establish new roots, there's a lot of stuff that goes on when you're cleaning rock and making decisions that people who haven't experienced that, you know, maybe you do one or two roots, but if you really like dig in and you're working on whole crags and you, know, you just get confronted with these scenarios and I'm not saying it's like outright like drilling into the rock not anything like that but there's sure. a lot of there's gray area there because yeah. when you're cleaning you're yeah. pulling stuff off of yeah. the rock you're making it safe yeah but you're not designing a route no 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 not that but i mean sometimes you're hanging on the rope for you know your eighth hour on your third day and <laughs> you're stuck and there's this thing happening in front of you and you're not sure what to do and you're like maybe i go crazy and i pull this thing off because i'm worried about it or maybe i just mm -hmm. say screw it and i leave it and then you're worried about you know the safety of people climbing and and those that's like in my mind just the decisions that people who just go sport climbing they don't ever put up roots they never ha they never think that like that has to happen mm -hmm. and that basically always has to happen yeah i mean if you do it long enough you're always confronted with these weird scenarios when you're putting up roots where you're just like man i don't really know what exactly to do i probably have to just like go and pull this 
big <laughs> piece of jaws off the rock. But it's kind of like, you know, you, it's great because you're altering the, you know, it's not like it was the way you, when you just walked up there and sure. you just slap some bolts in and then you go rock climbing. And so sometimes you hear people that are very opinionated and um, I think that's cool. Everybody should have their opinion and, and be heard. But um, sometimes they just seem a little bit removed from all of the factors that maybe they should know before they're mm -hmm. sort of partaking in the conversation yeah yeah because there's <laughs> like they've you know for years they've been climbing on roots and i think if they like saw what happened to like get that root or the, those roots or those crags like in shape to be climbed safely at by the masses they would i don't think they would be like oh yeah they're they're manufactured in gym roots that's not the conversation, but they might be a little horrified at what happened to get the roots. Yeah, not everyone wants to see how the sausage is made. No, exactly. It's pretty gnarly. and Totally. You'd, you'd be surprised at some of the uh, tools that are brought to the crag to, to clean them up as far as like crowbars and for sure um, all different types of... Six-foot crowbars. Yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> it also is so depends on the where you're at and the crag and the wall and so it's uh -huh. like not every wall. and the type of rock yeah it's like some walls you go up to and it's like scrubbing and brushing and you're good mm -hmm. to go and some walls it's tapping and filing and you're good to go and some walls there's you know five thousand pound flakes that need to come off the wall mm -hmm. and you're like wow are we really gonna bother with this mess you know yeah and that was like there was some huge like multi-pitch moderate route put up in Squamish yeah. and they were like pulling <clears throat> trees out of the crack and stuff. Yeah. You know, it's not always just the rock. It's also the vegetation and yeah. there's al always something that you have to deal with. And one thing that I think is also a problem is there's really no hard, fast rules to this. Right. Like my uh, Matt Samet, who's the editor over at climbing, we were just talking about how he red tagged a route. And some other people came and wanted to try it, and he didn't really know how to handle it. And there are no hard, fast rules, right? So, like, it's a matter of kind of, like, personal ethics and, you know, uh, style. Yeah. So it's a little difficult. difficult. But um, let's take a quick step back because I don't want to talk about that the whole time. Um, I'm here with, and I'm going to butcher your last name a little bit. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but Kyle Vasilo Vasilopoulos? Yeah, sure. What is it really? Vassalopolis. Is it? Okay, cool. I got it somewhat right. It took me a little bit. but So you were born in Southern uh, California. Yeah. Moved out to Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, it was, yep. And why, your parents moved you out there for, did they move for a job or something? Oh, my dad was in the Air Force, so I was, okay. I was just born there, but it was just a hot second and, you know, I was born there and then they almost right away moved to Minnesota, which is where I grew up. Okay. Yeah. And then you spent some time in Montana, New York City. Yeah, I was in school and lived in Montana for 11 years-ish. Were you uh, in Bozeman or yeah. Missoula? Yeah, Bozeman. Okay. Yeah, it was a great place and almost never made it out of there. Yeah. Which is not a bad thing, but yeah, there came a time and I w had an opportunity to go do some more school, um, culinary schools and stuff in New York City. So I went and did that for a little bit. And I think I might, because I lived in New York City for a while. I worked over on Varick Street. Nice. Um, in Houston. And I think I might have passed the International Culinary Institute. Was that where you went? Yeah, I think now it's called the International Culinary Institute. They kind of rebranded it. But it was it was the French Culinary Institute. Okay. Yeah, same place. All right. Now yeah. they just turned it into the International and how did you get into that? How'd you get into cooking? Where'd that passion come from? Uh, probably just born out of uh, not really wanting to do like the traditional path in life and uh -huh. go to school and get the job and go to the office and work the nine to five. Um, I pretty much wanted to go climbing, yeah. um, but obviously I you know need to work and make money. So but those two aren't that conducive to each other, right? Like. To run a restaurant, which you run multiple restaurants here yeah. in town, and to climb both take a massive amount of time. For sure. How do you finagle that? Well, I mean, sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. You can't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes you have to make choices and um, you have to compartmentalize for periods of time. Uh huh. Yeah, so, I mean, you can't always. I mean, there's only so much time in the day. And, sure. But I think that people can still find successes and and you know, achieve goals, sometimes you have to compartmentalize for mm -hmm. a bit. You know, you gotta choose climbing over work and I did that all through my twenties and but I still had to work obviously so I was working in restaurants, you know. Mm -hmm. 
which is a great platform for anybody needing, you know, transient yeah. seasonal yeah, work. Yeah, I mean, totally. obviously, for for as long as there have been restaurants, it's been a decent way to, you know, make some money uh-huh. and to not have a lot of commitment. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. Yeah, and then, you know, eventually, though, maybe the, the scale shifts a little and you prioritize work over climbing for a period of time in your uh-huh. life. And, yeah, that's been sort of the program since I set up shop here and sort of dug in, dug my heels in as to, yeah, ease, mm-hmm. ease off a bit on the climbing end and have to, have to unfortunately, sometimes just do the work thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And why Lander? Lander's awesome, first of all, um, and I had been visiting Lander regularly for, again, since I was probably 19 years old, coming mm-hmm. down here from Montana on weekend trips, coming here on spring break trips. It's got a little bit of everything, it seems like. Yeah, I always liked Lander. I actually went to school in Bozeman with some um, friends that I'm still friends with that uh, f- grew up in Wyoming and then were moved and lived in Lander. And so there was always a sort of draw to Lander, both for friends and for climbing, and then I always just enjoyed it personally. Yeah. And I enjoyed getting out and I enjoyed climbing in the high country in the summer and going and I enjoy climbing on the the limestone around here. And so I always just really enjoyed it. Um, Uh So, yeah. But as far as actually ending up here and actually living here, it was kind of an odd series of events. I mean, there wasn't a lot of rhyme or reason to it. I mean, I always thought to myself you know, Lander would be cool. Like I'd definitely go and live there, but then there's the sort of practical hurdles. Like, what am I going to do there? You know? Uh And, uh, so that, I mean, that probably kept me away for years, but it was always in the back of my mind. Like, sure. If I ever figured it out, I'd, I'd go Mm -hmm. live in Lander. That'd be, that'd be awesome. I don't have to make the eight hour drive (laughs) to (laughs) to go climbing in Lander. You know, I just live there. And it's pretty inexpensive here. I imagine. Yeah. I think it's really accessible. I mean, I think, um, yeah, you can be here um, and you could have a, you know, a job and you could enjoy climbing and um, cost of living is pretty low and, you know, you're not having a commute or there's no, tra- you know, there's not no traffic, traffic, you know, <laughs> yeah. you ride your bike to work in uh-huh. the summertime and it's, you know, you're all within, you know, a couple blocks. So it's a, it's a small town Yeah, and there's pluses and minuses to that. I mean, there are things that are, that you get to enjoy living in a small town. And then, you know, there's also things that you don't get to enjoy because you're in a small town. Mm -hmm. But eventually there was this sort of opportunity to potentially have, you know, a job and a career. And I looked at it and I actually said, I actually turned it down for a year. I actually was like doing something else and I I passed it up um, because I was pretty happy doing what I was doing. But then a year went by, and uh, I was doing something that was seasonal still. Okay. And I had kind of gotten to this point where I was like, you know, I think I'm done with the seasonal program. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think I need a change. I think I am ready to sort of dig in and get serious about something and, like, um, you know, work. Yeah. So, so I, yeah. So I, did you move here with the goal of <clears throat> buying a place, being a business owner? N- no. Okay. No, I moved here with the goal of having some kind of job and going out and climbing with my friends and having a good time and Uh like just enjoying being in Lander. Uh And that's what I did, really. I mean, I worked really hard the first year. I I worked full-time, you know, full commitment job. But being here, you can do that and you can still basically go climbing as much as you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could go climbing every day if you really wanted to and still work a full-time job. Most of the year, the the crag that's in season is you know Sinks Canyon. Yeah. It's seven, I don't know, ten minutes from town, so you can run up there and do five pitches and come back in an hour, hour and a half, if you're super on it. And I mean, it's about as convenient as going to like a gym that's a mile away from your house. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so you can climb full time. And yeah, so that was like the program for the first year or so. Yeah. But yeah, but then slowly or not so slowly, to be honest, the work thing started to like, you know, morph and change and, and um, some different opportunities arise. And I just I had in that year, I met my wife here uh-huh. and she's from here. And um, we ended up, you know, we ended up getting married, obviously. Congrats. Um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah. So all this stuff's happening and some different things were taking shape on the work side. And I just decided that uh, it was time to 
to prioritize that and to sort of flush out all the opportunities there and see where that that road led me. And when did you purchase the cowfish? Was that one of your first restaurants here? Yeah, um, it was. Because for people that don't know, the cowfish is kind of like one of those iconic climber restaurant bar hangout places. Sure, yeah. And has been before you even purchased it. It's been here for a while. I don't know exactly how long, but. Yeah, I mean, don't quote me on it, but um, Jim Mitchell is his name. He's uh-huh. actually still my business partner. Okay. But he's basically the, the creator of the cowfish itself. Uh-huh. And um, it's kind of a, a long, awesome, crazy story about how all the stuff here sort of came to be. Can you tell me a little bit? You don't have to give me every detail, but it's fascinating to me. Um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Jim is actually a really cool, fascinating, um, dude. He's a great friend of mine and my partner. Um, and he's an athlete himself. He's a total monster athlete. He's, and he's not so much climber. He's more like a a crazy endurance athlete, like cycling and yeah, like triathlons and mountain triathlons and swimming. And, but he was uh, a ski patrol at Jackson hole Okay, way back in the day. And, um, him and a couple of his ski patrol buddies through a series of events they ended up purchasing the lander bar together Mm -hmm. long long time ago 30 plus years ago so that was sort of how he got into the whole lander scene and and um he lives um up in wilson okay um and he yeah anyway he they got the Lander Bar and, And at you know, that time it must have been like, I mean, this was like a cowboy town. Very different. It was very, because I was here 10 years ago and it's changed so much just in 10 years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wasn't here, but it like very different yeah. scenario. So there was no <laughs> Gannett Grill. Yeah. There was no restaurant over there. Um, it didn't really look at all like it does today. No 2.0 coffee shops. No, 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 no. Bakeries. None, no, none of that. No, none of that. So, I mean, it was like, yeah. A, 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 Gun shop and like yeah. kind of like a shitty grocery store. Yeah, and, and the and the little, yeah, the little cowboy bar. Yeah, and the cowboy bar. Yeah. yeah. But those guys were super um, on it and super creative and, and uh, well-traveled and they had a great eye for a bunch of stuff. So slowly they just started like bringing all this like really cool stuff you know doing improvements and doing renovations and they ended up creating the Gannett Grill Mm -hmm. and bringing food program to sort of that bar and then you know they ended up striking up a relationship right from the very beginning with the local climber community that had had kind of come to Lander and sort of discovered the the climbing around here and right from the first year I believe it's Greg Miles, one of Jim's partners, sort of ha- was a climber and mm-hmm. was in like full support of everything going on. And he had kind of striking up a relationship with them the first year that they did the Climbers Festival and was, you know, the bar was sort of a supporter from year one mm-hmm. of everything that was happening. And then, you know, it started off like super, super, super grassroots. I don't even know. Don't again, don't quote me on it. <laughs> it was like, I don't know. There was like 15 people the first year. Yeah. You know, it was like super, just a group of friends. And they had this idea to have like this cool gathering and sort of encourage each other and promote the idea mm-hmm. of, of the climbing around Lander, Wyoming. But the bar was there and the guys were there and they were, you know, come and hang out at the bar and what can we do to help and support. So then, yeah, so symbiotically, both of them sort of grew into the future, the climbing community, the Lander Bar. And then eventually um, Jim ended up, uh, you know, doing the cowfish next yeah. door. Anyway, yeah, so I had met Jim, and we had talked a lot about stuff, and um, I ended up becoming partners with Jim, you know, a year or so after I moved here, and uh, yeah, we've been cranking ever since. And it seems like you're expanding. Are you guys, you know, partners expanding together? Or are you going out on your own, or uh, no, is it's, that all working? Well, yeah, we just opened a new restaurant in a neighboring town in Riverton, mm-hmm. and it's a... It's like a local Wyoming beef, you know, burger and wood fire pizza place and yeah. local beer from the Lander Brewing Company. And um, yeah, no, Jim's still my partner. We're still doing some fun stuff. And yeah, I still got him on the hook. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> so why why all the expansion? Is it because there's opportunity, because it's fun? Uh, I mean, I think... Just because? Yeah. Because you can? Because, cause, yeah, because you can. Because... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's the same sort of thing at some point, at least for me, for work-wise. You just decide you're going to do some something with yourself for work. Mm-hmm. And when that ball starts rolling, you just 
keep going with it. I don't know. Yeah. I yeah, wonder I'm, if it's a little bit like climbing. Like once you finish a project, it's yeah. not as exciting anymore and you want to find a new project. Yeah. It's maybe like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah. I think you got to be careful though because um, – it's still work, you know? Sure. Yeah. But, and that's what I'm kind of getting at because it just seems like you keep putting more and more on your plate at the same time, you know, you're doing so much other stuff. You're also an athlete for uh, mystery ranch for Adidas for camp. Yeah. I mean, you got a full plate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, everything in life is a transition, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really hard to be static and even if you think you're trying to hold tight on a static line, it's not really happening ever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm as I am, you know, getting older and transitioning through these new, you know, adventures and different things I'm doing, you know, all that stuff sort of just moving and transitioning too. So, I mean, I don't really think of myself as a athlete. You know, I find that I have these like sort of deep um, rooted friendships and connections in the climbing industry. And I've known people for, you know, 20 plus years and I have seen like their progression mm -hmm. in the companies they work for and seen the progression of these, these companies that I've supported for, you know, as long as I've known them. And, you know, now I'm still in support of everything they're doing and they support what I'm doing. And so it's, you know, it's more sort of just morphed into this sort of professional community of, sure. of, of relationships and mutual you know support for what everybody's trying to achieve well how did you get in touch with these brands did they find you or at a certain point like just reaching out to them because you like their product or I, I think it was different for each one okay i don't think that i have any kind of tie to any brand that i have not been you know had a very close relationship to them for you know 10 plus 15 years or something like that i don't really mm -hmm. even know or, you know, known and been very good friends with somebody that's been, you know, working away really diligently and, and, you know, been committed to a brand and what they're trying to do. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just try to stay in touch with everybody. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like <laughs> a nice thing about, about you know, getting older in a, in a community. Small world. Climbing's a small world, even though there's a lot of people out there. You know, I grew up with uh, the Helke brothers in Minnesota, and mm -hmm. I grew up. I'm a bit older, but I grew up with Andy Rather, and he was oh, like wow, little yeah. young tyke climbing in the gym, and I was probably 17 or 18, and he was, you know, I don't even know, 13 or 14, and so these people are still around, and now Andy sure. owns a climbing gym, and you know that Josh, Josh owns, owns organic, 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 and just and, built a new building over there in PA. Yeah, and Jesse Matner, you know, yep. down in over his camp. A camp, and you know, I grew up, you know, with him too. Uh huh. Yeah, and so you know, and then one of my other, you know, really good friends is at the helm over at mystery ranch and we've been friends since we were teenagers and um so i imagine you connected with mystery ranch and <clears throat> the people over there when you were in montana over in bozeman yeah absolutely I, I mean living in bozeman and mystery ranch is this sort of hometown you know yeah company based out of bozeman so and and uh, they've always been like a strong presence in that area in that community in in the outdoor sort of circles in pretty much all of them really skiing yeah. and uh, definitely climbing with dana designs you know backpacking you yeah know, definitely on the yeah and, and forefront of backpack technology yeah and when they made the you know when, when all that when everything changed and it and it was then mystery ranch and it's still you know located in in bozeman it was it was i think it was pretty quiet for a while you know but the but the hometown people like everybody in Bozeman and every they didn't they knew about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't a secret to them, and they were very aware of, of Mystery Ranch. And you know, it was like you know all the the coolest people at the ski mountain <laughs> yeah. had the little Mystery Ranch you know pack totally. the hometown like company and yeah you know it was like the most desired you know hometown outdoor product. Uh huh. Yeah, and still like it's still that same you know quality design and quality oh, yeah. products. But now now they've got you know now they've got a lot of stuff going on, and you know they've really expanded upon everything that they're working on for the outdoor industry. And mm -hmm. yeah, they got all sorts of yeah. Cool I'm psyched stuff. that they're focusing more on climbing now. That Tower 47 is an unbelievable crag pack. I can't wait to get my hands on one. So we're here for the International Climbers Festival. Uh, are you busy with uh, preparing for that? You got a lot of events going on. Yeah, it's always a real busy time of year. It's good kind of busy for sure. But yeah, we've we try to be, you know, 
to do our part to sort of help support the event in every way we can um, from our little base of operations. So is it stressful, or do you get to enjoy yourself a little? I mean, it's got to be fun having everyone in town and just yeah. having like everyone from the community out and about. Yeah, no, it's not. It's actually not super stressful. Um, <laughs> good. It could be. Yeah, you have some good managers underneath. Oh yeah, we, out. <laughs> yeah, we the whole everybody that is here, all the staff, the managers are awesome. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it has the potential to be pretty stressful, but because we worked really hard to get ourselves, you know, in a, in a good spot to, to be able to handle the increase of volume and still have a really good time. I mean, it's not super stressful. It's, it's a good time. Is the non-climbing community around here psyched when climbers come into town? I think so, and I think that that, is, thankfully, has changed a lot in, like, the last five years. Okay. And I know that, you know, CWCA and the organization that sort of oversees the festival, and they also oversee a lot of, you know, things in the community, climbing-related and, and outreach and youth, and, and, and they kind of have their finger on the pulse of all that stuff uh, as a nonprofit that helps in the community. But they've worked, and we've worked very hard at sort of trying to, to engage and include the community more in the festival over the years and uh -huh. have it not just only be, you know, climbers that come in and then leave. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's really good. It's really healthy for the community, and it's really good to sort of sort of bring people into what's going on and get them involved and, and get them aware of what's happening and get them having fun too. So Cool. Yeah. And are you getting out climbing much these uh, days? Or Yeah, I, don't, I haven't climbed too much recently. I mean, I did some climbing last year. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's been a good winter, though. Did you get out on the ice? Uh, I did. I went up to Bozeman a couple times and got to go climbing, and it was actually super fun. I did some stuff with Mystery Ranch. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, actually, that was a lot of fun. Over I, at the Scepter? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we went back told up. told me about that. We went all over the place, really. We climbed on, on you know, different walls and different formations in the canyon, and I hadn't really been back to highlight itself to ice climb in some years, and it was awesome. I had a great time. Cool. That, if you, if anybody, you know, if you have an interest in doing some great single pitch, you know, uh, ice climbing and getting checking it out um that's such a cool place to do it so that was awesome cool yeah well thank you so much for your time and thank you for all you do for the event and for the community and it's great talking with you yeah thank you thanks kyle all right that's the conclusion of the show i want to thank all of our guests including kyle vasilopoulos and matt samet and james lucas also want to thank our sponsor mystery ranch Theme music was provided by Small Houses at smallhouses.band. And if you're not done so already, please make sure to go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe. Well, that's it. See you at the next base camp. <laughs> <laughs>